Really? One more minute. Okay. There are 30 people. 30 persons. So not too much. Well, I don't know if you want to start. Okay. Bueno, buenos días a todos. Bienvenidos al segundo encuentro del simposio virtual sobre inmunología e inmunoterapia en enfermedad de Chagas. En nombre de los organizadores, la doctora Karina Gómez, el doctor Andrés Albati, quien les habla, queremos darle la bienvenida a los oradores del día de la fecha, así como también a toda nuestra audiencia y agradecerles nuevamente su presencia en esta jornada. Por otra parte, Nobleza Obliga, queremos agradecer a todos los auspiciantes que mediante su apoyo posibilitaron la concreción de este simposio. Ellos son la Facultad de Ciencias Médicas de la Universidad Nacional de Rosario, la Sociedad Argentina de Inmunología, la Sociedad Argentina de Protozoología y Enfermedades Parasitarias, el Instituto de Investigaciones en Ingeniería Genética y Biología Molecular del CONICET, INGEVI, y el Instituto de Inmunología Clínica y Experimental de Rosario, IDICER, ambos de CONICET, y así también al Ministerio de Producción, Ciencia y Tecnología de la provincia de Santa Fe. Now, I switch to English. Good morning to all of you. We would like welcome our foreign speaker and also to the audience for joining us today the second meeting of our symposium. Today, we will have four excellent speakers. Dr. Wilson Sabino and Ricardo Gassinelli from Brazil, Eric Dumontel from USA, and Emilio Malchiodi for our country. Regarding to our program, all the speakers will we have a 30 minutes for their talks, and the audience will be able to ask questions for 15 minutes. Questions could be made in Spanish, English, or Portuguese, and we will translate if it is necessary. Questions could be open, uh, sorry, question, um, we will not open the microphones to avoid confusion, and hence, we gently request to you write the question in the chat, and we will read then after the talk. We also ask to you keep your microphone silence for respect. So, there are something with the microphone open. So, following this introduction, it's uh, my great pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Dr. Wilson Sabino. Wilson Sabino was graduated in biological science at the University of the State of Rio de Janeiro, and later he got his PhD in cell and T cell biology, uh, tissue biology at the University of Sao Paulo. Um, and developed a postdoc training in cellular immunology at Necker Hospital in Paris. Currently, he is well researched at the Osvaldo Cruz Foundation, Pio Cruz. Additionally, he is the coordinator of the National Institute of Science and Technology on Neuroimmunomodulation, funded by the Brazilian Ministry of Science of Technology. He received several awards, like you see in the photo. And the last year in Argentina, he received the Eduardo Charro Award. His research is mainly focused on cellular immunology with emphasis in cell migration <laughs> in the myopoietic system, cell therapy, immunotherapy, and neuroimmune and endocrine interaction. Until now, he has published 330 peer review articles, many of which are regarding to Chagas disease. Today, he will tell about, uh, tell about, about the neuroendocrine imbalance in Chagas disease and their consequence on T cell development and migration. Thank you very much, Sabino, for joining us today. And please go ahead with your presentation. Bueno, eh, muchas gracias, Ana. Y no sé si tienes que 
quitar la... Yes. Bueno. bueno, muchas gracias a todos los, los organizadores, Karina, Ana, Andrés, y para mí es con mucho honor y mucho gusto que estoy aquí, y en particular, por supuesto, con Ana, que es no solamente una colaboradora desde hace muchos años, pero también, es más importante, una gran amiga mía, una, uno, un ejemplo de amistad de brasileña argentina que a mí me gusta muchísimo. Así que muchas gracias. Muchas voy, gracias, Sabina. Y voy a cambiar para hablar en inglés porque mi portuñol no es bueno. Y la verdad es que voy a compartir la pantalla. Espero. No sé por qué. Ahora sí. Un segundo más. Y ya está. Están, están viendo. Uh, yes, it's all okay. Están viendo. Está bien. Yes. Bueno, bueno. Bueno, así que yo estoy en esta. Uh, sorry. Uh, I'm in this round table a little bit as an outsider because I'm not going at all to speak about vaccines against Chagas disease or even therapy, but just a little bit uh, something uh, concerning a possibility of therapeutic approach. But, but actually what I'm going to speak about is um, pathophysiology of um, experimental and a little bit human uh, Chagas disease, but focused on the title of this, uh, of this talk, which is the neuroendocrine imbalance uh, in Chagas disease with consequences upon uh, T-cell development and migration. Uh, most of the work uh, has been done in mice, but some complementary work also in, 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 a, in acute... Sorry uh, for the microphone. Um, uh, as I told, most of the work being done in mice, but also uh, some work done in humans, including a strong and long-term collaboration with uh, the University of National University of Rosario, with Ana Rosa, Oscar Botasso, uh, and uh, all the group of the institute. So again, thank you very much for the invitation. And um, uh, I'm not going to discuss about what Chagas disease is, only the fact that uh, our infection is presently a major issue in Brazil, uh, particularly in the Amazon River, but not exclusively. And then uh, one week ago, uh, Juliana Demis from the same lab where I am, I told you, a little bit more about oral infection. And I'm going to discuss in the end of my presentation, some data, some unpublished data concerning an uh, endocrine imbalance uh, also in oral infection. So my, my point is actually uh, discuss a little bit concerning the chronic phase, but particularly in the acute phase and lymphoid organs, and of course, more particularly in the thymus. So, Uh, in order to um, get a little bit more uh, comprehension about the data uh, concerning the changes occurring in experimental uh, Tucruzai infection, uh, I think it's worthwhile to spend some minutes um, talking about some general features of the thymus. Uh, actually, the thymus is a primary lymphoid organ in which thymocyte differentiation occurs. Uh, such uh, differentiation allows the uh, production of uh, both CD4 and CD8 T cells. Once matured within the thymus are able to leave the organ and uh, install themselves in the uh, T cell dependent regions of peripheral lymphoid organs. Uh, which uh, by consequent be enabled, an individual be enabled mounting a, a cell-mediated immune response 
either using uh, CD4 and or CD8 T lymphocytes. Uh, this uh, differentiation, as I told you before, occurs within the thymic lobules. The thymic lobule is a microscopic structure composed by a cortical region uh, with large amounts of lymphocytes and some cells which are not lymphocytes collectively uh, called as the thymic microenvironment. Whereas in the medullary region uh, of the thymic lobules, the uh, proportion of differentiating thymocytes over non-thymocyte cells uh, is lower, so we have less density because of the there are less numbers of nuclei in the medullary zone. And in fact, uh, I think you can see here, um, precursors from the bone marrow enters the organ, go through the outer cortex, and these are cells uh, recently uh, originated from the bone marrow. Uh, they encounter uh, cells of the thymic microenvironment in the outer cortex, particularly thymic epithelial cells, which are able uh, to secrete, for example, uh, interleukin-7, which is absolutely necessary for these early precursors that arrived in the thymus to proliferate uh, and uh, otherwise they die by neglect. And uh, at this point, these cells do not express the CD3 TCR complex and do not express as well neither a CD4 nor CD8 accessory molecules. So they are called NABO negative because they do not express neither CD4 nor CD8. Uh, the progress of these cells, if they don't die, uh, is to proliferate and uh, to change uh, the uh, phenotype in terms of CD3 TCR complex, which gradually appears in the membrane uh, of these uh, uh, maturing uh, thymocytes as well as the appearance of CD4 and CD8. These cells, which are also have a high level of proliferation rate, uh, these are now double positive cells because they express simultaneously CD4 and CD8. These cells are again exposed to uh, the thymic microenvironment, particularly cortex, cortical thymic epithelial cells and they undergo uh, what is called a positive selection that derives from the encounter of the T TCR uh, complex with um, uh, molecules of the uh, major histocompatibility complex, either uh, the class one or class two containing an endogenous peptide, which is then presented to the double positive cells and this generates either a signal of going further in, in the differentiation, which is a positive selection. If they don't interact through the TCR MHC peptide complex, they just die by neglect, but they also can die because of high avidity of this interaction. And this is the negative selection, which, is all, which also occurs uh, within the medulla, not only uh, upon interaction of, with the thymic epithelial cells, but also with the thymic dendritic cells, DCs labeled uh, in this slide. So this, um, uh, the cells that uh, manage to be positive, positive selected and not negative selected, either CD4 or CD8, they are able to leave the organ uh, through capillaries in the cortical medullary junction, and then they go to uh, populate the T cell dependent zones in the peripheral uh, lymphoid organs as lymph nodes, spleen, etc. Or uh, so we can see that uh, now in the cortex and medulla, we have this uh, gray network which corresponds to the thymic microenvironment. And these stars 
uh, which correspond to uh, secretary products from the thymic microenvironment. And all this uh, together uh, drive uh, developing thymocytes upon the seasons of life and death. And those which are positive selected, if they are selected uh, in the context of MHC class two, they become a CD4 single positive cells. If they are positively selected in the context of MHC class one, uh, they, uh, they developed into uh, mature CD8 single positive cells. And these cells in normal conditions leave the organ uh, to the peripheral uh, lymphoid organs, whereas uh, double negatives and double positives in normal conditions virtually do not leave the thymus. Um, as we are going to see in a moment, uh, it's quite important to see uh, the classical uh, flow cytometry of thymocyte development by uh, staining CD4 and CD8. And so we see this airplane in which the most immature cells are the double negatives here. They progress into double positives, which represent the vast majority of total thymocytes. They undergo positive and negative selections and those positively selected thymocytes, uh, they are either uh, CD4s or CD8s and these cells can actually uh, in normal conditions leave the organ. So these are the several kinds of interactions that can occur between one thymic microenvironmental cells and a developing thymocytes. We can see this in bifocal microscopy. This is the membrane of a thymic epithelial cell uh, with a developing thymocyte just seated on uh, the membrane on the membrane of the epithelium. Particularly, uh, I think uh, we're going to discuss a little bit more on uh, secretary projects like cytokine, but particularly chemokines and also interactions, cell-cell interactions mediated by extracellular matrix proteins, as well as their corresponding receptors uh, expressed on the membranes of both thymocytes and thymic microenvironmental cells. The second concept I'd like to highlight before going into uh, some data on Chagas disease is the fact that uh, T cell development is um, physiologically controlled by a number of hormones and uh, neuropeptides actually, as well as neurotransmitters. This occurs in physiological conditions and can be altered in different kinds of disease. And I just like to uh, highlight uh, prolactin as well as the uh, HPH8 uh, uh, axis um, um, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis with the CRH, ACTH, and glucocorticoid secretion uh, at endpoint of this uh, influence upon the thymus because we are going to discuss a little bit more on that. But I'd like to tell you that um, both uh, other, other hormones and uh, growth hormones as, as uh, sexual steroids can also uh, affect uh, thymic functions, both in terms of proliferations versus death of thymocytes, as well as uh, the thymic microenvironmental cells. So now we get into uh, what's, what's going on in infectious diseases, particularly uh, in uh, acute infectious diseases. And one of the um, major and common feature is the thymic atrophy that has already been detected both in humans uh, and experimental infectious diseases. And then in this table, uh, which now is expanded actually, but uh, a number of virus infections, bacterial infections, protozoal infections, fungi infections, and also helminths, uh, they produce a number of common uh, effects upon the thymus with 
cortical atrophy, either seen by histology or immunohistochemistry, but also by flow cytometry in which there is a major depletion of CD4, CD8 immature thymocytes. So these you can see here, most of the data are animal data, but you also have some examples of human data. And this is not different in Chagas disease. What we have demonstrated three decades ago, actually, for the first time, was that the thymus was, could be infected by, by Tipanosoma cruzi, and actually uh, the parasite can infect epithelial and non-epithelial cells of the thymic microenvironment, not only in, uh, in vitro, we have demonstrated that, but also in vivo by electron microscopy. Uh, and uh, we, uh, what we have is a major decay in the number of uh, living thymocytes, which uh, are in parallel with in a sort of increase in the parasitemia. And when you see the, such a uh, decay uh, in the numbers of, of thymocytes, when you see the CD4, CD8 profiles of these cells, what we see mostly is the loss of the cockpit of the airplane. So this is the control at day 15 in this case, and day 21. And you can see you, you go from 80 to 8. So one log difference in the, uh, the per, uh, percentages of uh, double positive cells. Of course, this also corresponds to a de enormous decrease in the total number of thymocytes from each subpopulation, but particularly uh, CD4, CD8 double, double positive cells. So we also demonstrate that such a uh, decrease in the number of thymocytes uh, do not depend on perforin or fast fazel, fazel, uh, fast ligand uh, mediated interactions. Then you can see here in perforin knockout and the GLDD uh, mice, they also uh, undergo the same pattern of progressive thymic atrophy uh, with uh, both uh, here in the case of, uh, you compare in C infected, uh, non-infected, but infected. There's, in this case, there is a major, but not exactly the same as the previous image that I told you before. Uh, and when you see uh, this kind of profile is exactly the same in which uh, in animals in which fast physiological interactions are, are uh, blocked or do not exist actually. Uh, also, uh, this, uh, sorry, uh, this, uh, uh, this cortical depletion occurs in different kinds. We have tested uh, together with Jean Santana and, and Ana Rosa Perez, uh, different uh, knockout mice and actually uh, usually TNF alpha knockout mice, they also undergo, uh, INOS knockout mice also undergo thymocyte depletion, cort particularly cortical thymocyte depletion. So uh, uh, in the context of such a huge, uh, uh, let's say transformation of the thymus upon acute infection, we uh, also uh, defined some interesting uh, features that are altered uh, uh, along with uh, the infection, both in the thymic microenvironmental compartment and in the uh, uh, lymphoid compartment in terms of uh, production of extracellular matrix proteins as well as expression of the corresponding receptors. And what we, you have in this uh, slide in the left panel is the uh, normal profile of uh, fibronectin expression within the thymus. This is a septum, so this is the cortical region. This is the medullary region of a thymic lobule. And this is what happened 
uh, in a thymus of a mouse uh, acutely infected by uh, Cipanosoma cruzi. So there is a shrink of the organ together with an enhancement in extracellular matrix. And uh, what we have also demonstrated uh, is that such an enhancement is not only due to the fact that uh, the organ has shrinked, uh, but also because uh, we obtained in vitro data showing that there is actually uh, an enhancement in the production of extracellular matrix like fibronectin, but also laminin and type 4 collagen. So coming back to fibronectin, uh, we also uh, demonstrated that uh, one of the uh, fibronectin receptors, VLA4, uh, particularly we studied the alpha-4 unit of the LA4, the molecule called CD49D, which is, by the way, a marker of T-cell activation. Uh, what we have here, particularly in the uh, uh, immature cells, both double negatives and double positives, is that there is an enhancement. So there is the loss of cells, so dies, you know, in, in huge amounts, but those who are still there, uh, they progress progressively, uh, sorry, they progressively uh, enhance the density of VLA4 in which, you know, by the end, those thymocytes, uh, either double negatives or double positives um, that remain in the thymus, they have a much more intense uh, expression, membrane expression of the LE4. Um, in addition to that, uh, one of the chemokines which are important for intrathymic T cell migration, which is CXCL12, also increase these, uh, this uh, chemokine is able to bind to fibronectin. So we uh, applied uh, double labeling in confocal analysis to see that uh, there is a co-localization of fibronectin and CXCL4. Uh, this is enhanced uh, in the infected mice, and this can be, you know, uh, quantified in terms of pixels by square micrometer. And um, what which is also interesting is that not only the ligand CXL4, CXL12, but also the corresponding receptor CXCR4 is also enhanced in uh, infected animals, particularly in immature cells as compared to controls. So what we have here is two important elements on physiological T cell migration within the thymus, fibronectin and CXL12 which are altered and actually uh, enhanced within the thymus of acutely in infected mice. Uh, and if you put these cells to migrate uh, over fixed uh, concentrations of fibronectin in the presence or absence of uh, fixed uh, contents of the chemokine CXL12, we see that uh, the migration ability to, to, of, of the thymocytes through fibronectin towards uh, CXL12 or to both is largely enhanced as compared to controls. And such an enhancement is mainly seen in the double negative and the double positive com uh, compartments. So both uh, immature, most immature and immature uh, thymocytes, developing thymocytes. Uh, this can also be seen actually in, in vivo uh, by using, uh, you know, you can inject uh, a fluorochrome within the thymus in vivo and then look for fluorescent cells in the periphery. And what we can see is that there is an, an enhancement in the numbers of the recent thymic immigrants, which are FITC uh, positive cells, both CD4 or CD8s or 
or double positives or double negatives. But uh, the fact is that there is an increase in the numbers, both in the spleen and in the lymph nodes. And this is the total. Uh, as the thymic atrophy and the acute infection progresses. And what is interesting is that we observed, and this has been done uh, in my laboratory and also in collaboration with Ana Rosa Perez, is that uh, there was an increase in, uh, you know, uh, an abnormally presence of CD4, CD8 double positive cells uh, in the periphery. This is our lymph nodes with the spleen as compared to control, both in the percentages and absolute numbers of cells uh, in the periphery uh, appear abnormally, uh, which goes with the function and the high expression of cells uh, in terms of uh, receptors related to, to uh, T cell migration. Uh, actually, uh, I'm not see, showing the data, but uh, there is a higher expression of receptors for both fibronectin and CXL12 in these immature, abnormal uh, CD4, CD8 cells in the periphery of the uh, immune system in mice acutely infected by T. cruzi. Uh, so here they are again. And uh, we also see in this in chronically infected mice, uh, they are activated. So this is uh, an, an infected lymph node, but uh, uh, you see cells, uh, double positives. Once they are uh, isolated, they are high expressors uh, of CD49D, but also CD44, which is a protoglycan, also a marker for T cell activation and of course, TCRs. Uh, interestingly enough, uh, these cells have also been detected in, uh, in the periphery of patients uh, bearing Chag chronic Chagas disease. And there was, there was a positive cor correlation uh, in terms of total number of cells uh, as the uh, severity of disease progresses uh, from indeterminate phase to cardiac phase of the chronic uh, Chagas disease. Uh, and again, we showed uh, together with Alexandre Moho that these cells uh, exhibit an activated phenotype for both CD49D, but also HLA-DR uh, uh, markers. And finally, uh, we also note the, the uh, presence of double negative cells in the periphery uh, so uh, this, this is the spleen, this is the lymph node. So there is a number of uh, not only of CD4, CD8 positive cells, but also CD4, CD8 double negative cells in the periphery. And again, the same thing has been seen uh, in um, uh, Chagasic patients. So this show that there is a, a, an export of uh, immature thymocytes that could have an, a an importance or a function uh, in the periphery in terms of the pathophysiology of the disease, particularly a possible autoimmune component. So just to uh, finish this part, um, I'm not, um, can, can you tell me how many minutes I have yet? 10 minutes, Arina. Okay. Uh, so uh, what we can see here is the changes that we have demonstrated within the thymus with release not only of CD4, CD8 single positive cells as in physiological conditions, but also release of double positive and double negative cells, which goes to, to immature. It goes to the secondary uh, lymph nodes, but can also go into the heart. And uh, we have demonstrated with, actually Anna Hauser has demonstrated the presence of double negative cells or double positive cells within the heart uh, of uh, infected mice. So, um, but in addition to that, so, so far we discussed this, uh, these changes 
in differentiation and migration of, of thymocytes uh, into the periphery uh, under the, the condition of acute Chagas disease infection, acute T. cruzi infection, but also we demonstrate that there is a disruption in the hypothalamic pituitary adrenal axis. And, uh, you know, there are other actor, uh, several authors that have demonstrated that. Here, what you can see is that there is a significant enhancement of uh, cortical uh, trophin releasing hormone. There is not a significant enhancement in ACTH, but there is a significant enhancement of corticosterone. So there is an, a, you know, a disruption of the hormonal status, normal hormonal status of the HPA uh, axis. Uh, IL-6 per C is able to induce uh, or to enhance corticosterone production. So, uh, so this now put the a hormonal imbalance uh, as the title of this talk uh, revealed uh, in the context of what's going on in terms of the times that we see uh, immediately. So there is such an enhancement in corticosterone pr production, such an enhancement uh, which goes uh, with uh, a decrease in, in total number of thymocytes and release of immature cells if we block uh, uh, the, uh, the glucocorticoid receptor by uh, RU486, uh, you block the thymic atrophy as compared to the uh, you know, control oil or non-treated. So such a reduction, you can see here, the, uh, the airplane, the cockpit of the airplane is much more preserved as compared to control. So it also means that we do have a role of corticosterone uh, in the thymocyte depletion that occurs uh, in uh, experimental Chagas disease. But uh, it's not only uh, this hormone which is altered uh, in, in experimentally infected animals, other stress-related hormones can be altered and particularly prolactin. We have studied, you know, many, many years before the role of prolactin in the thymus, the, the, the fact that the thymus is able to produce prolactin. Uh, in the literature, there is the uh, number of data, there are, you know, solid data showing that uh, glucocorticoids can also be produced within the thymus in addition to uh, the, uh, the adrenal glands. So we also measured not only uh, the periphery, but the interthymic production of um, a stress immunosuppressive hormone like glucocorticoids or corticosterone in mice and a stress immunostimulating uh, hormone as prolactin. And it's interesting because the intrathymic production of corticosterone has this kind of curve with a diminution and then an increase, which is almost a mirror for the intrathymic prolactin production, which goes up and then down by the end of the uh, by the end of the infection. So, and this can be seen here in terms of of uh, intrathymic prolactin. Uh, by immunohistochemistry, you have an enhancement and then a, a, a certain decrease uh, in the expression of prolactin. And this we have uh, uh, quantified both in the cortical region, the medulla region of the thymic lobules. And we can see that the, the, the event occurs both in, in the cortex and in the medulla of infected thymic. Uh, also, there is a, another mirror uh, images, which is in terms of, uh, along with uh, the uh, decrease in the number of thymocytes and decrease in the cockpit of this airplane, we also have a decrease 
in the expression of glucocorticoid receptor, but an increase in the expression of prolactin receptor, showing that there is something you know, uh, interesting in terms of the balance between glucocorticoid secrets and prolactin secrets within the thymus, as well as in the periphery. And just to summarize that, uh, we can see that in the plasma, the, sorry, in the plasma, there is a decrease in prolactin production with an increase in glucocorticoid uh, uh, levels uh, in, in circulating then. In, uh, in the, within the thymus, there is an increase in the expression of prolactin, progressive increase in the expression of prolactin receptor, decrease in glucocorticoid re, uh, receptor, and uh, a decrease in the production of glucocorticoids and an increase in the production of prolactin with outcomes like thymic atrophy, apoptosis, as well as enhanced thymocyte export with, for example, the presence of double positives and double negatives, which are not labeled here, but not only double positives, but also double negatives, immature T cells in the periphery of these uh, lymphoid organs. Uh, interesting enough is the fact that if you use metiropone which is an, in, an inductor of prolactin synthesis, uh, we can see that uh, such a, a uh, decrease of the uh, cockpit of the airplane in, in after the infection is completely changed if we uh, inject the mice with material that, you know, partially but significantly uh, prevents the, the huge thymic atrophy. And uh, you, you can also see here the thymus itself in a PBS versus uh, metiropone treated infected mice on day 15 post infection. So, this you can see the number of thymocytes. So, uh, it's interesting that then not only there was such a mirror or counterbalance between prolactin and uh, glucocort circuits in the periphery and uh, within the thymus, but also, and now we demonstrate that metiropone, which uh, enhances prolactin production in the animals, can also prevent, at least partially, but significantly, the uh, uh, apoptosis of these cells. Uh, and also, they decrease significantly the numbers of immature, in this case, CD4, CD8 positive cells uh, in peripheral lymph nodes, for example, here. So not only uh, this, you know, if you change the uh, prolactin status in the, uh, in the animals, not only you prevent significantly the glucocorticoid induced thymic atrophy, but also uh, you prevent largely, not totally, but largely the release of immature cells, which can be also then, uh, you know, uh, something to think about in terms of uh, uh, therapy. And just to finish to show that uh, uh, Juliana told you one week before the, that uh, we have uh, settled a neuroinfection uh, model in mice here. Uh, she developed that, by the way. And uh, the question is if orally infected mice would also have the same kind of pattern uh, uh, as, we, uh, as we told you before in terms of IP injected mice. And the answer is yet, yes. So there is the thymic atrophy, which can be seen here and the loss of the cockpit or partially loss of the cockpit, as well as the appearance of immature cells in peripheral lymphoid organs here exemplified by the spleen. And just to finish, we also, sorry, we also demonstrated that uh, there is an, uh, a disruption in HPA axis for following oral uh, infection with the appearance, by the way, of the parasites in hypophysis and also in hypothalamus and an increase in corticosterone. So apparently what we had before showed in terms of the neuroendocrine uh, imbalance 
uh, in, in, in mice injected uh, intraperitoneally can also be seen in mice orally infected, which is quite interesting in terms of comparison with acute infectious disease in humans due to uh, you know, swallowing uh, par living parasites. And I think this is all. I, uh, should, I say, should I just tell you that this work has been done in the context of the uh, uh, National uh, Institute of Science and Technology on Neuroimmune Modulation, with these people in the lab, also Ana Rosa, Belos, Juan Belos Cardinal Scarbotazo at the National University of Rosario, Alexandre Moreau uh, at Fio Cruz now, but also uh, belonging to the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro with uh, these uh, financial uh, important things. Uh, and that's it. Thank you very, very much. Thank you, Sabino. We have a question. The first is from Karina. Karina? Uh, yes, uh, thank you, doctor. Very nice talk. Um, I have a question, but you answered during the, the talk. So I'm going to reformulate the question. Um, because you also observe in your MICE model that uh, you have a double positive and no double negative T cells in the periphery. Uh, so, uh, do you know that all of these cells are uh, or come from the thymus? Because during the adult time of, of, of the mice, of the patient, is, is very difficult to know because the thymus is not anymore. It's so, atrophic. Yeah. Uh, um, when you label the, the experiments that have been done labeling uh, the, the thymus with fluorescein azothiocyanate, so direct injection of uh, FITC. So what, what FITC does is to link to the serine residues in, on the membrane of the cells. Uh, so let's say about, depending on the experiment, you have from 70 to 90% of thymocytes which are labeled. Uh, if you take them, they also have the same pattern of, of, uh, of the airplane, let's say, so they represent the whole thymus. And when you then uh, over, let the mouse uh, overnight and then take the organs uh, 18 to 24 hours later, you, uh, the, uh, the fluorescent cells that you see in the periphery are those recently emigrated from the thymus. So you can fax them, you can you know, phenotype these cells. And uh, a quite number of cells are actually uh, from the thymus. We have done experiments on thymectomy, using thymectomy uh, before uh, the, uh, the, the infection. And there are some cells that also occurs, but you know, it's almost nothing as compared to euthymic mice in which you do have the thymus and you do have the exit of, of the cells uh, from the thymus, particularly by the end of, of the uh, thing that, the end of progression of the disease. Not thank sure you. if I answered. Uh, I hope I could, I could answer your question. Yes, thank you, okay. doctor. Um, uh, Dr. Gassinelli? Yes, um, yes, Dr. Gassinelli. Hi, Sabino. Uh, was very nice. Um, I think this is, uh, since it happens in all sorts of infection, it might be a mechanism of, of to enhance host defense. And my question is whether um, you look for the specificity, like if you stimulate with T. cruzi antigen or other host or other, other pathogen antigens, versus cell function, what, what's, do you have an idea about the specificity of those cells? Okay, uh, very nice. Thank you for the question. Uh, there are two things I'd like to use to answer or to approach your question, perhaps answering your question. Um, the first thing is that uh, we have um, 
done together with uh, uh, Alexandre Moho and Ana Hawaza uh, functional experiments. So these uh, double positive cells and also double negative, but we have done most of the experiments with double positive cells in the periphery. Uh, uh, they express uh, gamma interferon, they express perforin, they are able to kill cells. So they are really activated uh, T lymphocytes and they express variable amounts of TCR, but they do have a functionality. Uh, what we did not do is to kill uh, cardiomyocytes, for example. We, we haven't done that. Uh, so the other things in terms of specificities that I'd like to comment is the fact that we have using bulb C mice, which in principle delete intratimically V beta 5 and V beta 12 TCR families. Uh, we have the, such a deletion occurs within the thymus. So if you take uh, double positive cells within the thymus, they express. V beta five. So there are cells expressing V beta five and V beta twelve. When you go to single positive cells, they have been deleted. So let's say that within the thymus, negative selection is operating well. Let's say, but if you now look the same TCR V beta families in the periphery, we can see V beta five positive cells and V beta 12 positive cells within the double positive compartment in the periphery. And in addition to that, we see single positive cells expressing either V beta 5 or V beta 12, strongly suggesting that they bypass negative selection in the periphery so that to produce single positive cells with uh, autoimmune potent potentiality. Okay. Well, we have also an interesting question from Valderes Dutra. Sabino, thank you for your excellent talk. Have you tested if the increase in prolactin, which seem to hold the mature cells in the thymus, alters congenital transmission in mice? A very simple answer. No, we haven't. <laughs> But very uh, interesting to do. Unfortunately, not. Uh, but this uh, makes me uh, um, leads me to a very uh, short uh, comment: is that we have also tested. I didn't show you, but we ha have also tested uh, doing the opposite. Let's say injecting mice with bromocryptin, which is an inhibitor of uh, the uh, pituitary production of prolactin. And you do have a shutdown in in the seric, in the serum prolactin. It doesn't change too much uh, the expression of re glucocorticoid receptors, or even uh, glucocorticoid levels. And we, but we don't see uh, changes in the intratimic production of prolactin. So intratimic production of prolactin seems to be under a different control circuit so that uh, the, the cells, the, which are thymic epithelial cells, by the way, uh, they are not sensitive to bromocryptin differently from what is classically known in terms of prolactin producing cells in the pituitary gland. Okay. Thank you. We have other question uh, from Jaime Lopez. Uh, doctor, are you planning to test this? with different uh, DTUs of t DTUs? Uh, let's see that we have tested uh, not prolactin, but we have tested, uh, let's say, thymic atrophy. It occurs with different strains of mice, different strains of t Glu uh, Glucocorticoid enhancement serum corticosterone occurs uh, with different strands of mice, different strands of, of, 
uh, T. cruzi. So apparently, this is a general uh, phenomenon which is not depending on a specific mouse strand or on a specific uh, T. cruzi strand. What has been done at the Federal University of Rio de Janeiro by uh, a researcher called Morgana is that she used a non-pathogenic T. cruzi strand and she didn't see thymic atrophy. We did not have done that. We, we, we did not do that, but uh, she, she has done these experiments. So apparently the, uh, the fact of being pathogenetic is something important for uh, the thymic atrophy, which is not so surprising because it generates a stress much more important in the, in the animal. May I ask another question, Anna? Yes. Yeah, uh, I don't want to do different between genders because it's not the time. But do you see any difference between male and females related to the formal signals? Um, again, uh, in terms of corticosterone enhancement, I think this is a general event. Uh, we we did not do profound comparative studies on males and females compared to females, just because we didn't have enough arms and brains and mice and et cetera. So we chose uh, usually female mice, but, but apparently at least as regarding a corticosterone uh, enhancement, it seems to be a very, very general event. Okay, thank you. Thank you. When we have the last question because we are on time um, from Gabriel Cabrera. Uh, he said very nice talk. Did you measure survival when RU486 inhibitor was used? Yes, no, very, very nice question. Uh, actually not. Uh, our, our question was not uh, re regarding survival, but for sure, this is a very important issue that should be addressed. Thank you. Thank you very much, Sabino, for your presentation. Thank now, you. Thank you all again. We turn to Karina, I think. Or no, uh, no sorry. Andres. The next talk, Andres. 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 Because, yes, we, ch we have a little change in the order of speakers. Now it's the turn of uh, Dr. Ricardo Gassinelli. Yes. Well, uh, as Anna said, our next speaker is Professor Ricardo Gassinelli. Dr. Gassinelli is a professor in the Division of Infectious Diseases and Immunology in the University of Massachusetts uh, Medical School. And he's also the head of the Laboratory of Immunopathology in Centro de Pesquisas, René Rajou, in Fiocruz, and the director of the National Institute of Science and Technology of Vaccines, dependent on the Ministry of uh, Second, Ministry of Science, Technology and Innovation. Dr. Gassinelli has published more than 300 articles studying, among others, the immunology of Trypanosoma cruzi, but also the innate recognition of Toxoplasma and Plasmodium. In addition, he has participated in many projects related with the discovery of vaccines against Trypanosoma cruzi and Leishmania. Dr. Gassinelli has also characterized different ligands of cell like receptors in Trypanosoma cruzi as well. Today, he will, he will tell us uh, about the development of new vaccines against Riparosoma cruzi. Thank you very much, Ricardo, for joining us today, and please go ahead with your talk. Okay, so let me see. Okay, can you see that? Yes, we can. Okay. Uh, first, I'd like to thank Andres for the invitation and say, and uh, Karina and Ana Rosa, and say that's uh, uh, really a pleasure to be here and, um, and uh, discuss a little bit the vaccine. We're going to have, uh, we had a nice talk from Savino, and I'm sure we're going to have nice two, two talks on vaccines. So I think it's, it's a very interesting. Uh, section. Um, 
so um, I start talking about the the use of vaccine for Chagas disease, and <clears throat> this is the natural course of Chagas disease. I'm sure most of you here already know all of that, but just to uh, refer, refresh the mind of some of you, uh, we have uh, during Chagas disease we have a period where you have a intense replication of the parasite. You find them uh, in the uh, in the periphery, as well as in the tissues, uh, and the cardiac tissue are a main site of parasite replication. And when uh, you develop the immunity, uh, acquired immunity, here is a campaign in the strong, on this acute phase, a strong inflammatory response that uh, has the involvement of the innate immune response and also the acquired immunity. But once you develop a strong acquired immunity, you control the parasite replication and you have a phase that you have uh, asymptomatic uh, disease with very low number of parasites. And then uh, 10 to 20 years later, then the parasite may emerge. Uh, and that's a very uh, interesting question, why they come up uh, after such a long time. And then you will have the, this uh, chronic uh, cardiopathy or uh, the uh, mega digestive clinical forms of the disease that um, there is a big discussion whether this is an autoimmune component or if this is related uh, to inflammatory response elicited by the parasite. Um, so if you think of a vaccine for Chagas disease, I think you can actually have a, a different uses for it. Uh, the first one is the more traditional prophylaxis uh, that should uh, you want to control the primary infection, but also you can use a vaccine associated to drug <clears throat> treatment that will then be a, <clears throat> a, a good way to decrease uh, parasitism. We know that a lot of the drug, uh, the drugs that are available are not very good in clearing the parasite. So maybe if you associate immune stimulation with drug treatment, you can have a more efficient uh, clearance of the parasite. And also there is the idea that if you treat, uh, if you treat with uh, uh, immunotherapy, use a vaccine as immunotherapeutic agent, uh, you may reverse the course of disease and prevent the development of this more severe cases of Chagas disease. So when we talk about vaccine, there are multiple antigens that are candidate of vaccine, but probably uh, the main ones are the members of the active transialidase family or just the trans transialidase family in general. Uh, uh, the parasites have about a thousand genes, a little bit over a thousand genes that codify uh, the transialidase, and they can be divided in uh, innate groups. Uh, the group one is the one that have the active transialidase. So what's the role of transialidase is to uh, cut um, uh, the sialic acid from the host and transfer to the parasite. And there is a big uh, also uh, discussion what's the role of this uh, transfer. There are some people that say that uh, allow, uh, allows the parasite infection of the host cells, escape of the vacuole, and we have now evidence that the main role is uh, the, of the transialidase is to contribute to uh, uh, parasite egress from the host cells. Um, and then, so one of the transialidase we use are this member of this uh, family. And then the other one um, we use is uh, belong to the family of uh, uh, Terrancialidase 2 and um, is, is uh, called the ASP2 that's uh, highly expressed in the mastigot form of the parasite. 
So this is the our general idea. We have this form that is a must go specific. And our idea is that these will be the main target for CD8 T cells uh, because they should be presented by the infected cells. And since the parasite lives in the in the cytoplasm, and the cells should uh, be uh, highly efficient in presenting uh, the parasite antigen. And the second target is the uh, is the active transialidase. And they, sh they are target for antibodies uh, expressed in triple uh, recog that recognize the triple mastigote forms. Uh, and uh, we believe that they uh, actually, um, they may help to clear uh, intracellular as well as extracellular parasite. Uh, these transcellulase have uh, these uh, repeats in the uh, in the end, car carboterminal end, and uh, which are very strong at, uh, B cell epitopes. So, um, in a uh, long time ago, I, I think this was published in 2006, uh, we uh, construct the adenovirus 5 that's ex uh, expressed in the ASP2 and also the TS, and use that to vaccinate mice. And um, um, and this gives a very strong protection. Uh, if you can see here, uh, this is the parasitemia in the Balpsy mice. Then this is vaccinated with one of the adenovirus or the other adenovirus or the combined two adenovirus. And the group that received the combined uh, adenovirus Really, uh, we have even mice that we couldn't detect parasites uh, by hemoculture, suggesting that that could be uh, sterile protection. Um, uh, we also look at different uh, 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 strains of the parasite. Here we use, um, on the first, uh, on this study, we use the Y strain. We have also used the CL strain and here we use the Brazil strain and the Colombian strain, and the vaccine protects all groups and protected also against the long-term pathology, uh, suggesting that they have a role in controlling the chronic infection as well, and uh, so and also indicating that they are um, they they protect against different lineages of the parasite, which is very important because. Uh, this different lineage, so uh, quite a lot of uh, antigen differences and so on. Um, uh, my colleague, uh, uh, Jose Lilanis at Fiocruz, uh, she, I think she was a Savino student at one time for uh, on early on her career. Um, she also showed that you can, uh, in mice, using this Colombian strain that caused the chronic disease, um, you can actually protect the mice from dying. Uh, here is the un, un, uh, mice that received the, the control adenovirus without the T. cruzian. And so here you can show that you can protect the mice of mortality and also reverse the pathology. Um, after treatment with um, with this vaccine uh, later on on infection at 120 days and then uh, you give a bo boost at 160 days and so the therapy uh, uh, the vaccine has also a therapeutic effect. One of the problem of the adenovirus is that uh, I guess these were being discussed a lot nowadays uh, due to this all these adenovirus for COVID-19 uh, as uh, used as COVID-19 vaccines is the problem that they elicit a response again against themselves. So often the second boost, um, the boost is not so efficient because the immune response already recognized the virus. And uh, so, and of course, then also you cannot use multiple vaccines using adenovirus for the same problem. And so, and then there is also um, 
although the adenovirus is actually uh, uh, not a very expensive vaccine, but um, we would think that um, to use a recombinant vaccine, protein recombinant vaccine would be more uh, better in terms of cost benefit. So what we did is to generate a chimera that expressed part of the mastigot uh, surface protein and, uh, and part of the transallidase. We select these segments based on the presence of the uh, T-cell epitopes. I think uh, Emilio has a very similar vaccine, but I guess he uses a third engine. Uh, if I'm if I remember correctly, it's cruzipine, but we will see on his talk. And also we include the B cell epitopes on this chimera. And here is each of the, gene, the segments uh, separate. And here is the uh, chimera that has a molecular weight about 50 kilodaltons. And the way we vaccinate the mice at 0, 21, 42 days, and then we challenge them at 72 days post-infection. And then we analyze the immune response and uh, some of the aspects of the survivor mice at 132 days. And uh, first we look for the response. Uh, we call this Chimera DTT1. And uh, they produce very high levels of IgG, um, IgG1 and IgG2C. Um, when you comp uh, that's uh, on this model, the adenovirus is a very poor inducer. Here is the adjuvant for just the adjuvant, and here, but the 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 adenovirus is a very poor inducer of antibodies. So, despite the fact that they are induce a strong protection, um, probably most is T cell dependent and uh, uh, very little is related to the induction of antibody. If you look for the interferon gamma, you can see the adenovirus is a very efficient inducer of interferon gamma. And here is the uh, chimera, also induces uh, good levels of gamma. They are both not so good in inducing uh, IL-10, which indicates that they may be very inducing uh, a strong T cell mediated immunity. Um, then, if you look for protection, here is the um, <clears throat> uh, non vaccinated mice. Uh, and then uh, here is the uh, adjuvant or uh, uh, adenovirus that does not express the T. cruzi uh, antigen. And here is the protection. Um, they have much lower peristemia, though we don't see. Um, <clears throat> any mice that don't have peristemia. Uh, and here is the survival curve again. The two vaccines are very good. And if you go to 90 days post-infection, you also see a good protection where the protection to induced by the adjuvants is gone. So you have a really uh, adjuvant effect at 30 days post uh, uh, after the boost, but not uh, 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 at 90 days, um, when you challenge at 90 days. So the adjuvant effects goes away, but anyway, we still have uh, protection. Yes. Um, and here we look for CD8 T cell response. Again, we see a very strong CD80 cell response with adenovirus and less uh, of a response uh, with the uh, recombinant engine, despite the fact that you see similar levels of protection. Um, if you go uh, and look on the virus knockout, uh, it seems that the, despite that you don't see a strong CD80 cell response, it seems that the CD80 cells are still important on the immunity induced by uh, the vaccination with the chimera. And, uh, and also uh, interferon gamma is very critical uh, to this response too. 
Um, so uh, this is the second part of the study where we took this chimera and uh, tested on dogs. Again, we did a prime at uh, time zero, a boost at 30 and a boost at 60. And then we challenge at 90 days post uh, after initiating the vaccination protocol, we measure uh, antibodies and T cell response. Um, please, Ana Rosa, tell me when I have uh, five minutes to finish so I can. Uh, yeah. I wait long. You have still 15 minutes. Okay, great. So I'll be able to finish on time. Um, <clears throat> so, first, we look for the, any side effect of the vaccination. On these dogs, we don't see fever, weight loss. We see a, lot, a little bit of a local pain, uh, especially with the mice that were, or the dogs that were vaccinated with the uh, T. cruzi antians. Uh, we see a little bit of local edema, but not, nothing much in terms of um, uh, uh, in the side effects, suggest indicating that the, the dogs are very highly tolerant to the, this vaccine formulation. And again, uh, if we look on the, on the antibody production, again, we see that the, uh, the recombinant protein associated to poly-IC induce a very strong antibody response to ASP2 or 2TS. Um, but if you look compared to the adenovirus, then uh, you have a very low response or non-response antibody response. Uh, if you look to the um, <clears throat> to the T cell response, interferon gamma response, we see again a very strong interferon gamma induced by the the, the recombinant protein and a more viable response when we look to uh, in the dogs vaccinated with adenovirus, and this is before infection. And then after the challenge, then you start seeing uh, interferon gamma response in all groups as the parasite also stimulate the, the T cells. Uh, and the same about antibody, the main target of the, the Antibody response seems to be the uh, TS protein rather than the ASP2 uh, uh, protein. And uh, when we look at the dogs, uh, we found these are the different parts of the of the heart: the right ventricle, the and the left ventricle, the right atrium, the left atrium, and the apex. And most of the parasites we are able to detect in the apex. Uh, and here, if you look of positive animals uh, uh, on for tissue parasitism on different group, uh, this is the control, just the adjuvant, just the adenovirus. And here is the, uh, actually it's the opposite, just the adenovirus, just the adjuvant. And here is the adenovirus expressing uh, TS and ASP2, and here is the chimera protein. And you can see that there is much less uh, infected animals, uh, much less parasitism on the uh, vaccinated animals than on the animals that received uh, PBS or the uh, contro adjuvant controls. And the same is true for the number of parasites as indicated by the uh, PCR. So here are the control groups and here are the, um, the dogs that received the, the two vaccines. So uh, clearly indicating an effect uh, on protecting the dogs against the myocarditis, uh, the parasite in the cardiac tissue, and also uh, protecting against myocarditis. You can see here is a dog that received PBS, uh, the adjuvant, adjuvant plus the chimera protein. And um, here is the, um, the receiving the plasmid and the plasmid expressing ASPTS. In the case of the, the adenovirus, a plasmid adenovirus, we use a heterologous prime boost. 
Um, you can see here that there is a, a, an adjuvant effect. So the adjuvant apparently protect as well as the uh, the vaccine in the case of the uh, the the, the um, on the chimeric protein, then you have uh, uh, the adjuvant does not protect, just look like the uh, um, dogs that receive PBS and the dogs that receive vaccine has much less inflammation. So uh, on this part of the uh, talk, we can say that uh, prophylactic and therapeutic vaccination with the adenovirus expressed in a combination uh, at TS and ASP2 uh, are protective both on prophylactic or therapeutic schedule. Um, the TS ASP2 chimeric protein is highly immunogenic both in mice and dogs and induces uh, protection which is CD8 and interferon gamma dependent uh, and as to protect dogs challenged with Ticruzzi uh, uh, and then the vaccination was with the chimeric protein prevents tissue parasitism and inflammation of dogs challenged with T. cruzi. So the second part of this talk is using, a, we begin by using a, a, a strain derived from the CL brin, it's called the CL14, which was uh, cloned, isolate, cloned, uh, isolated and cloned by one of our colleagues, uh, Egler Chiari. Um, <clears throat> and uh, we tried to use that as a vaccine vector because it was totally non-pathogenic. It induces a strong CD4 and CD8 T cell response and uh, apparently has an impaired replication and persistence in the host. So you have a T cell response for a long time. And this is a Caroline Jukeras. She's today is an independent investigator at Phil Cruz. So the project she, she got to do was to, tra uh, to transfect, uh, 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 do a, a, a permanent transfection of T. Cruz with a, a tumor antigen called the NYEZO1. And um, uh, she showed that she could use uh, these parasites to vaccinate against tumor and they were highly efficient in preventing tumor growth. Um, this was her PhD thesis. And then she also showed, and this was uh, done earlier by other groups like Serli Gattaz in Rio, uh, showing that this L14 was highly efficient in protecting uh, mice against challenge with uh, uh, the parental CL uh, strain and also other uh, uh, strains of T. cruzi. It induces very high levels of antibody and uh, also T cell responses specific for T. cruzi. Uh, we did the genome and the transcriptome, every single of, of this strain, because we wanted to understand what was the defect of this strain. And we got to this result, which today we're still not able to explain how the, or to imagine how that happened. But uh, <clears throat> what we found is that they are active uh, uh, transallidase. They didn't have the, uh, or they have a way less uh, SAPA repeats, what, which are the main target of the antibodies. So if you look here, if you use an antibody against SAPA, you see them on the triple mastigot uh, from the wild type, but you don't see uh, on the CL14. So, um, However, when you infect a highly uh, immunodeficient mice like the interferon gamma or the, new, uh, the rag knockout mice that don't have T cells at all or B cells, um, these strains become pathogenic. So suggesting that they still survive, they have a, a way low rate of replication, 
But if you don't have any immune response, uh, then they, they, will, they will become pathogenic. They can uh, reverse in, and this is in vivo. So uh, what my colleague uh, uh, Santu, in collaboration with my colleague uh, Santuza Teixeira de Oliveira, oh, Santuza Teixeira, no, no Oliveira, Santuza Teixeira, um, she's an ex, uh, excellent uh, molecular biologist, and she actually set up the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology to knock out genes of, to edit the t genome, so what we uh, did was to uh, use this technique to knock out all the um, transaldase genes. As I said, uh, the, the parasite has multiple uh, genes that encode um, the transaldase, active transaldase, I think there are 16. And one of the big challenge was to remove all these genes at the same time. And uh, that became possible with the CRISPR-Cas9 uh, technology. So the primers were designed to, to edit and make this uh, uh, transaldase non-active and actually delete them to, from the, the genome. And um, so here are two clones that were uh, we isolated after the deletion of those genes. This is the one that was partially, the genes were partially deleted, the, the clone three. And clone seven, we believe that all genes have been deleted. And here is the parental uh, strain and the wild type. And you, if you look for the activity of the, the, the Transalidase is still, you can detect a lot of activity on clone uh, three, but not on clone seven. So for this uh, indicating that in clone seven, we have uh, eliminated all the genes. Another way to look at that is, the, uh, is to measure the sialylation of the parasite. As I said in the beginning, the transalidase, trans transfer sialic acid from the parasite surf from the host surface to the parasite surface. So here is an antibody against the TS, actually, and you see um, um, here, they, they don't have the, in the epimastigot, at least this epitope. Um, and then you have on the uh, wild type and the Tripomastigot expressing Cas9. And here is the antibody against the sialic acid. And uh, you can see that both uh, parasites have sialic acid, but not the, the knockout mice. So the knockout, oh, knockout mice, sorry, knockout parasites. So the knockout parasite don't have uh, uh, sialic acid on their surface. So first we look at then what was the effect of the knocking down all the, the, the active transsilidase. Uh, we can see that the parasite grows, uh, grow well, uh, both the clone three and clone seven. Maybe there is a small decrease on parasite replication on clone seven, um, but uh, this is two day of infection and this is, uh, four days after infection. But the main effect we saw was that the, the parasite wouldn't go out of the cell. So if you look for free parasites, here is the uh, wild type and here is each of the knockout uh, uh, parasite. So suggesting that the egress of the uh, parasite is compromised. And this is very interesting because this is really uh, the same role uh, that neuraminidase has on the influenza virus is just uh, the virus to go, uh, to be released from the um, <clears throat> whole cell, it needs the neuraminidase. So virus that don't have neuraminidase, they can't go out of the cells. So we still have to understand and study a lot of that, but uh, that uh, we think that would be the main function of the transalidase 
And that, I mean, um, in, the, in other studies, they have suggested that uh, uh, transcellulase was very important for infection and the uh, exit from the parasitophorus vicule, but we don't see that effect. Um, so we use this uh, strain that don't have uh, transcellulase, the, the uh, one seven that don't have any, and uh, we infected uh, the knockout mice that are highly susceptible to T. cruzi. We see a very high persistemia with the wild type that has just the Cas9, but we don't see any persistemia with the knockout parasite. And here, no mortality, uh, suggesting that this uh, strain is totally apatogenic. So uh, in contrast to the CL14 brand. And here we look for protection. If you give uh, the uh, um, uh, the knockout parasite with no transcellulase, active transcellulase, we see total protection. With, there is no, uh, uh, this is the non-vaccinated mice, the parasitemia, and this is the vaccinated, here the mortality. And if you look for tissue parasitism, we basically don't detect uh, any parasite on the uh, vaccinated mice. Here's the heart, skeletal muscle. We use the Y strain that has uh, more tropism for skeletal muscle. And here's the um, interferon gamma response is very high on the vaccinated. And here's the antibody response. So the conclusions too um, is that the Highly attenuated CL14 lacks gene expressing uh, the SAPA containing domain uh, and induces long lasting protective immunity, but still uh, pathogenic in uh, highly deficient, immunodeficient mice. Um, uh, they, they both induce a strong CD8 and uh, interferon gamma uh, response. And that um, the, uh, the, the knockout parasite that has no TS genes uh, show um, deficiency in aggressing the whole cell and does not cause disease in highly immunocompromised interferon gamma and, uh, knockout mice and uh, uh, induces also uh, uh, very strong protection. Uh, so uh, I'd like to actually thank some of, uh, these are all our collaborators. Uh, these uh, studies were done in the context of the Institute of National, um, National Institute of Science and Technology for Vaccines. Um, and we have the support of different agencies. And um, I'd like to thank you, uh, Julia Castro, which is a, a, who is a PhD student in the lab. She actually did most of the work with the chimera uh, antigen, both in mice and dogs. Uh, Joseli Lanius uh, Vieira has been our collaborator long term, uh, who, who actually did the immunotherapy experiments. Gabriela Burley and Santuza Teixeira we did uh, generated the knockout parasites for TS. Uh, the group in Oro Preto who did the experiment uh, in dogs. And uh, Mauricio Rodriguez, unfortunately, is no, no longer with us, but was the person who really started all these uh, uh, vaccine studies using the TS and ASP2 uh, angio. And, and I think that's what I have to say. And I, I'm here to, if there is any question. Thank you very much, Ricardo, for the excellent talk. So we have a question from uh, Shamil Masip. Uh, doctor, do you think that your adenovirus candidate could generate an efficient response in individuals previously immunized with other adenovirus-based vaccines, thinking about SARS-CoV-2 vaccines like Sputnik? Yeah, yeah, I think uh, um, that's been a very, a lot of people, a lot of people discussing that. And um, um, of course the Sputnik vaccine is a very good strategy uh, because they use a different adenovirus on the first and second uh, 
boost. Um, and, and that's, I, I think it makes sense. Um, still have some data showing that the, using the same adenovirus in the, uh, the Shadox from Oxford uh, induces, it still induces some antibody response, but I don't know if we need like a, a every year or every uh, vaccine, I, we don't know yet how it's it going to, 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 if it's going to work well. Also, if you go to the original uh, studies that were the, uh, performed by the um, Oxford group, they always use two viruses. They use the MVA and the adenovirus. Normally they avoided to use the, the Shadox two times. So I think we still have to learn. I mean, there is a lot of going on. It's possible that the response to more, the more protective response to SARS-CoV-2 is T cell dependent. So I think we'll, we'll, we'll learn more on the next uh, year or so about the efficiency of the shot dogs. But yeah. Okay. We have another question from Rick Charleton. Very nice talk, Ricardo. Do either the CL14 or the TS knockout lines induce anti-SAPA antibodies in mice? Yeah, I think we, we don't see uh, 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 much of a response to SAPA. So like if you look for the CL14, as I said, they have a big uh, depletion on the, the SAPA repeats. We did, we did this long uh, DNA sequencing and um, we could not find at least on most genes, we don't see that. So it's still that uh, small uh, part of um, the of the um, uh, of the SAP associated with these TSs can be immunogenic. But when we did the Western blot, we couldn't detect that. So my feeling is that they don't really have the SAP. I guess maybe we should try to do that more carefully, but so far we have no indication. I don't think we have done that experiment yet on the on the knockout uh, parasites, but uh, as you see, I, I'm sure they don't have any activity for the TS, but they might still, um, I mean, we need to look whether the whole gene was deleted, but I think it was just a, a, a segment of the, of the TS, active TS. Okay, so another question from Rick. Also in the dogs, if I understood correctly, the vaccinated and challenged dogs have reduced pathology, but not no pathology. So yes. presumably they were persistently infected. Do you explore this further specifically? Do the vaccinated dogs have a less severe chronic infection related to the non-vaccinated? Yeah, well, you're right. It was not a sterile immunity. So they were still infected. Uh, most of them have a low peristemia if you look in the blood. Uh, so, it, 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 and you, as you could see, we could detect parasite in the, in the tissue, heart tissue in most, not in all dogs as, as you saw. Some of the dogs were, were negative at that point, uh, which was six months post challenge. So that's the, the long we, we, the furthest we will go was six months post challenge. So we haven't really uh, kept the dogs for more than six months. So they may have evolved for chronic, but we don't know. They may would evolve, they, they may uh, would evolve for chronic uh, pathology, but we, we didn't, we, they were all sacrificed with six months post infection. Okay, so we have a question from uh, Carolina Ponsini, very nice. I think you, you, you said already, but thanks. Maybe I missed, but does TS knockout infect mice or after some time there is no parasite detectable? So you, I think you say that they cannot- Yeah, infect. it was very low as you saw on the PCR. We couldn't, when we vaccinated with the, the um, 
with the knockout uh, parasites, we had very low or non parasitism in the tissue. It was really, really like on the very, uh, we have to do a lot of uh, cycles to detect something. We, we don't know if that was really, it was on the uh, number of cycles was close to 40. So we don't know whether that was really a specific. Um, but, you know, we challenge with 30 days post vaccination. So we don't know how long that response persists. And we need to do those experiments. Okay. One more question from Valeria Tequiel. Uh, very nice talk. Thank you. Have you measured IL 17 levels in the adenovirus immunization scheme? And or explore how the innate immune response was stimulated. Well, we, we have a, a early study that we did some of uh, of, uh, uh, of the innate immunity response induced by the adenovirus, and we see that was mighty eighty-eight dependent. Um, uh, and we look some other um, aspects, and that was, um, um, I think also there is a, a nice paper from Bob Seder at NIH that he evaluated the uh, effect of the, of the innate stimulation of the adenovirus. But one thing I can tell you, always when we vaccinate with adenovirus, the control, we see an impact on the on the parasitism, uh, not only on T. cruz, but other on toxoplasma. So we think that the real uh, there is a real adjuvant effect that persists uh, for a long time, and that may explain also why the people that are giving Shadox they want to wait uh, instead of giving a second boost on uh, four weeks post priming and go to 12 because when um, then if there is an adjuvant effect you you normally you um, the, the the boost is less efficient and if you wait for two or three months then maybe the 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 uh, the boost become more efficient because you don't have uh, all the type one interferon that are elicited by the priming. And uh, I think that that may be one reason why they notice that second, uh, the boost uh, works better if you have a, 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 a more uh, interval, a, better, a bigger interval. And if you go back to our paper, uh, the one that I show in the beginning using the adenovirus, we actually, did the boost after six weeks post priming because that was uh, when the vaccine worked better. If you if you did the boost like four weeks post priming, it didn't work well. So maybe um, so I don't know if I answer your question, but that's it. okay. I think we have time for one more question. Uh, that is from Carlos Buscaglia. Thanks, Ricardo. Beautiful talk. One question. It's a long one, so please <laughs> be attentive. Considering, considering the experimental approach used CRISPR-Cas9 editing guided for short DNA sequences and the particularities of the system, active transalidase genes, show substantial overall and or localized or focalized homology to a huge family of GP85 transalidase genes, most of which contribute to the infectivity of the parasite, it is possible that in addition to active transalidase genes, some of these GP85 uh, transalidase genes might have been of target during, during the generation of the transalidase knockout clones. Moreover, due, due to the well-recognized plasticity of the TQC genome, would it be also possible that some of the on and of, uh, of targets editions in the analyzed clones were resolved by distinct kind of genome rearrangements, thus leading to alterations on their transcriptomic proteomic profiles. That's all. Yeah, yeah. Let me, uh, the first question: um, the primers that were designed to do the the deletion, they were selected because they were uh, specific for the 
transalities of uh, family one. So I think the way they were designed, um, it shouldn't have an off target. Um, but, you know, it, it, I think the, the other transalidase is still important to induce an immune response and a protective immune response. But the activity of the transalidase, I think, is the main one responsible for the uh, biology of the parasite and for the parasite that controls uh, the cycle of the parasite in the host cell. So I think that's why the parasites are attenuated because this transcellidase activity is very important. So the second question, I can you repeat the second question? Yes. Um, so, moreover, due to the well-recognized plasticity of the TQC genome, would it be also possible that some of the off-target additions in the analyzed clones were resolved by distinct kinds of genome rearrangement, thus leading to alterations in their proteomic profiles? Yeah, we had uh, this experience that uh, when we use uh, old methodology to uh, homologous recombination to do knockout parasite, it was very strange because you knock out one allele and uh, it worked well. When you go to knock out the other allele, there was some type of rearrangement and was very hard. They, apparently, the gene changed from place to place. It was uh, we never understood that very well, but that's that's uh, uh, maybe it's, it makes it very hard to do genomic manipulation on T. cruzi. But by the time we work with this parasite, we didn't see any reversion of this because I guess we knock out all the genes, so we didn't see any reversion, but you know, uh, time will tell whether eventually there is a revision of the phenotype. So far, we have not seen any. Well, thank you very much, Ricardo. So we continue with our next speaker. Okay, thank you. Okay, so I will introduce our third speaker, Dr. Emilio Malchiodi. Uh, Dr. Emilio Malchiodi was graduated in biochemistry at the University of Buenos Aires, Argentina, and he got his PhD at the Faculty of Pharmacy and Biochemistry at the same university. Later, he developed his postdoc training in Buenos Aires and also at the University of Maryland in USA. Currently, he's full senior researcher of the National Council of Science and Technology of Argentina, developing their studies at the Institute of uh, Studies in the in Umbral Immunity, Ricardo Mar Marni, Uidehu, and also in the Institute of uh, Research in Microbiology and Parasitology, in PAM, CONICET, Cuba. Now, he is the vice president of the Argentinian Society of Immunology, and he has published at least 130 peer review articles, many of them focused on the development of prophylactic and therapeutic vaccines against the parasite like Trypanosoma cruzae and Leishmania, being currently one of the most prominent researchers in this area in our country. So, Thank you very much, Emilio, for joining us today. Uh, and please go ahead with your presentation uh, about Crucibax uh, project. And if you want to share your presentation.
Emilio, you are mute. Thank you, Ana Rosa, for your presentation. Uh, and thank you for the, uh, for the organizers, to the organizers for the uh, very nice uh, seminars uh, in, in three days, uh, excellent talks. And I'm uh, so glad to be in this uh, seminar series. So I've been asked to present uh, our uh, Crucibat project, uh, which is the preclinical and clinical validation of a vaccines against Chagas disease. The yes, here is. Eric. Thank you, Eric. Well, thank you very much, Karina, and all the organizers for uh, the invitation to uh, share some of our research with you. Uh, it's really an honor after all those distinguished speakers to be uh, presenting some of our work. And uh, actually, I think being last is going to be helpful because a lot of the topics that I'm going to be uh, touching on have been covered by some of the, the speakers. So uh, hopefully I can go a little bit faster on some of those topics or they will make more sense. So uh, as has been mentioned earlier, uh, Really, we have limited options for uh, infected patients as the drugs we have uh, currently, nifurtimox or bentonidazole, have a limited efficacy and some severe side effects so that many patients have to interrupt treatment. Uh, and in addition to that, uh, because of deficiencies in the health system, a limited proportion of uh, tick infected patients have actually access to, to treatment. So that's really an issue that we need to address. And uh, one way to really improve uh, treatment for Chagasic patient is the idea of a therapeutic vaccine as has been mentioned in uh, some of the previous talks this morning. Uh, and uh, we're all familiar uh, with the, the development of Chagas disease, but uh, what I want to stress with this slide is that really uh, after the acute infection, most patients remain in that asymptomatic chronic phase for many, many years, and only a, a fraction of infected patients, between anything between 20 to 40 percent, will go on to develop the symptomatic chronic phase with uh, cardiac arrhythmias of increasing severity uh, that will lead to cardiac failure and death. So really the, the morbidity and mortality of uh, Chagas disease is only on that fraction of patient that will move into that symptomatic chronic phase. But for the majority of patients, the immune system is actually able to mostly control the parasite. Although those patients are infected for life, they're able to live healthy with the parasite. So really what we want to address with uh, treatment or vaccine, therapeutic vaccines is to keep patient in that asymptomatic chronic phase with no morbidity and mortality. Uh, so, and, and so the idea of a, of a therapeutic vaccine is really to help a little bit the immune system when the immune system is failing those patients and leading them to uh, symptomatic disease. So the first, uh, one of the earliest evidence of uh, a therapeutic vaccination, uh, we published that over 15 years ago in a very simple experiment in which we uh, infected biopsy mice with a little dose of parasite and then immunized those mice with two doses of uh, uh, DNA vaccines encoding different parasite antigen. And we tested uh, TSA1 antigen, which is part of the transhyalidase family that we've been hearing a lot this morning, and also another antigen, which is the TC24, which is a calcium binding uh, protein associated with the flagella of the parasite. And so by giving just two injections of those DNA vaccine encoding those different antigens to mice that have been already infected, we observed that we could uh, control parasitemia, if you compare with control mice, uh, that develop very high parasitemia. We control parasitemia, and there is a very good survival of those mice. So this really was a proof of concept that you can uh, actually boost the immune system in an already infected uh, mouse model to help the immune system better control the parasite and allow for, for survival. 
So based in part on those results, uh, we were fortunate enough, very similar to uh, the story that uh, Emilio just presented, to integrate a large uh, consortium of, of uh, public and private institution, uh, because you really need multiple talents to develop vaccines and uh, multiple disciplines. So we integrated a number of institutions in the US and Mexico to really try to uh, push forward the development of a Chagas disease vaccine. And so one of the first tasks uh, our consortium did was really to define what kind of vaccine we wanted to develop, uh, because it's important to know where you want to, to go to figure out a way to get there. So uh, again, we're focusing on a therapeutic vaccine, so for already infected patients. And we want a vaccine that stop, or at least delay the development of cardiac compli uh, complications to be administered to either asymptomatic or already symptomatic patients. And this is, again, an important strategic decision because we really want to focus on preserving or restoring cardiac functions. Uh, we've seen a lot of studies uh, in which people look at parasite burden or parasitemia, immune response. These are important parameters, don't take, make me wrong, but really the ultimate outcome is to prever, preserve cardiac function. Uh, we want a vaccine that could be administered to children and adults with a um, limited number of doses. Probably one dose won't be sufficient, but anything between two to four doses might be something realistic, easily administered via intramuscular. And we want an efficacy of at least 80% and the delay of those cardiac complications of at least 10 years. Uh, something that's been uh, discussed also this morning, we want a vac therapeutic vaccine to be compatible to current drug treatment so that maybe combining a drug treatment and the vaccine, we can get an even better control of the parasite and a better prevention of those cardiac complications. Um, so that's really where we would like to go with a, a therapeutic vaccine. So very similar to uh, what uh, Emilio just presented for their initiative, Developing vaccines involve multiple activities. We obviously all think about preclinical ev evaluation of a vaccine candidate to make sure that it works in different animal models. But there are also uh, multiple other activities from uh, how to produce in uh, GMP grade uh, vaccine, how to for optimize formulation, look at quality control, how stable is your vaccine, uh, what's its shelf life and how you may be able to distribute it. Uh, technology transfer of all those processes because it's not the same to pr produce a little bit of uh, a vaccine candidate in a little flask in the lab to do it at the industrial scale. Obviously, all the regulatory issues from FDA here in the US or COFEPRIS in Mexico and uh, other agencies in uh, other countries. And also, uh, as was mentioned earlier, also uh, cost benefit analysis to really look at the uh, economic value of having a vaccine. And those arguments can be used for, for funders to really uh, help motivate them to, to fund more research for, for Chagas disease vaccine development. So what we're doing in our consortium is that all those different aspects, we're trying to work on those in parallel so that any roadblock that we can detect in any of those aspects, we can immediately try to address that. And so for example, one of the earlier early decision that we needed to make was what vaccine platform do we want to use? And that what touched a little bit this morning um, uh, regarding adenovirus platform, for example. And this table shows you the platform of uh, clinical development of vaccines that are currently in clinical trial. And obviously this is not about Chagas, this is all vaccines that are currently in clinical trials. But that table uh, was made before COVID last year uh, so I think this vaccine development landscape might be changing in the next few years with the experience we've gained from uh, COVID-19 vac uh, COVID vaccine development. But if you look at that table, uh, a lot of vaccine enter phase one clinical trial, but very few vaccine make it to phase two and phase three clinical trial. So that's very, uh, no DNA vaccine has made it to phase three trial, only one adenovirus made it to phase three clinical trial. Again, that's changed with COVID. Uh, but really the most accepted, one of the most accepted platform is recombinant protein that uh, has a very good uh, product.
reduction in safety profile that favors the move to through clinical trials. So we decided, although our initial uh, efficacy data were with DNA vaccine, we decided to switch to a recombinant protein platform to avoid those uh, regulatory issue and have a safer path forward through clinical trial. Uh, so our biotechnology colleagues developed production process for our two antigens, TSA1 and TC24, and I won't go into the details of the different processes because this is really not my uh, expertise, but they're able to develop processes for the industrial scale production of our two recombinant antigen with very high purity and low endotoxin content. We've been doing a lot of preclinical studies looking at how those uh, antigens, uh, recombinant antigen, could control T. cruz infection in infected mice, very similar to the study I presented initially. So this is an example of histological aspect of the heart of mice treated with a TC24 recombinant protein. And you can see much less uh, uh, T. cruzy parasite and much less uh, inflammation compared with saline. Uh, and the same thing with the TSA1 uh, recombinant protein. We have a nice decrease in uh, uh, tissue inflammation in the heart and a nice decrease in parasite burden in the heart. But again, as I mentioned at the beginning, parasite burden is very informative, but what we really want to target is cardiac function. So we've really developed our uh, EKG recordings and we've followed uh, infected mice over time to look at how is cardiac function deteriorating during T. cruzy infection? And we could uh, really look at the times that uh, could coincide to the different disease phases in humans. So we can see the acute phase where we have active parasitemia in those mice. Uh, then what can be considered as an early chronic phase in when we start to have cardiac uh, alteration based on those EKGs and that lasts around uh, uh, around the day 140, 150, and then what would be the late chronic phase in you, which you really have uh, significant alteration of the EKG in those animals. So now we can use this animal model to really look at how can we preserve cardiac function with different treatments. And we've been testing our multiple combinations of vaccines at different times and doses. Uh, but what I want to show you today is the comparison. Uh, we use a treatment with benzidazole at 100 milligram per kilogram per day, which is the standard uh, dose that's been used for, for Chagasic patients. We also have a group of animals that receive a much lower dose of benzidazole, one fourth of the dose. Um, we have our vaccine alone. We also test our vaccine in combination with that low dose bentonidazole to see if we can have a combination between immunotherapy and uh, conventional drug therapy. And we've been administering, administering those treatments at different times during infection. So we can administer those treatments during the acute phase in which the first dose of vaccine is given at day seven after infection, second dose at day 14. When we use benzinidazole treatment, we give uh, benzinidazole daily for seven days at the dose I, that I indicated. But really what would be most important would be a therapeutic vaccine for patients already in the chronic phase because we rarely detect the acute phase. So we tested uh, vaccine and treatment administration during the early chronic phase. So we wait until day 70 after infection to administer uh, those treatments and then follow the mice until day 140 and to look at uh, cardiac alterations. Or we use a late chronic phase uh, model in which we wait for 140 days after infection. So those mice have already strong cardiac alterations and that's when we give the treatment and we follow those animals up to day 210 post-infection to relook at the effect of uh, vaccine treatment. Obviously, I'm focusing here on EKG because we believe this is the main readout of those uh, uh, for vaccine efficacy, but we're also measuring parasite burden and uh, immune parameters. Uh, but what can we see with uh, cardiac function? This is a complicated graph, so let me walk you through it. This is um, discriminant analysis of EKG parameters of infected mice. 
So these are uninfected mice as control, and these are our uh, early chronic infected mice. So they're already showing some signs of um, abnormal EKG. So what happened when we treat those mice with uh, benzimidazole, 100 milligram, we able to uh, rescue those mice and their EKG is much more similar to uninfected mice than uh, T. cruzi infected mice. What happened with the low dose benzinidazole? There's some improvement in EKG, but it's still uh, very much lower than what's obtained with the high dose benzinidazole. With the vaccine alone, we see a little bit of improvement, but again, that's not sufficient. But if we combine low dose benzinidazole and vaccine, we're again, are able to uh, restore uh, EKG very closely to what uh, we would like to see in an infected mice compared to the infected uh, animals with no treatment. What happens if we wait for uh, the late chronic phase? Again, we have here our uninfected mice. Here are untreated mice with saline that present important cardiac alterations. Now we're in the late chronic phase. So if we try to treat with benzinidazole, even at a conventional dose of 100 milligram per kilo, benzinidazole is not effective anymore to prevent, to preserve cardiac function. And this is again, very similar to what's been observed in the benefit trial, for example, in which patient with already advanced cardiac disease, we can decrease their parasite burden, their parasitemia with benzinidazole, but this has no effect on preserving cardiac function. With the low dose benzinidazole, we have some effect, but again, and this is not sufficient to really uh, preserve or prevent uh, the deterioration of cardiac function. But if we give our vaccine alone, or the vaccine with the low dose benzinidazole, we're still able to rescue some animal and revert the uh, cardiac alteration, and several of those animals have now a normal EKG again, uh, very similar to that of uh, uninfected animals. So really therapeutic vaccination during the chronic phase, either alone or in combination with a very low dose benzinidazole can stop or even revert part of the cardiac alterations that are induced by T. cruzi infection in mice. So this is really encouraging because this is what we want to target in our uh, vaccine. Uh, but here at Tulane, we're also fortunate to have a very large uh, facility at the uh, Tulane Primate Center. And there is a, we're following a large cohort of naturally infected Chagasic macaques. Uh, we're following a cohort of about 45 animals. They are on average 10 years old, and they've been naturally infected with T. cruzi from one to four years. So they're all in the chronic phase of infection, and they're all confirmed positive by multiple serological tests and PCR. So we want to use those animals to really better understand disease progression following natural infection and also use them for vaccine or drug studies. So one of the first things we did was to do some genotyping of the parasite to understand better what uh, parasite strains those animals were, were infected with. And we found infections with multiple parasite genotypes and DTUs, including a lot of TC1, but also TC4 and TC6 uh, in those animals with a lot of co-infections. And this is really important because when we look at what's infecting human and we've looked at uh, Chagasic patients from Mexico or from the US, we see a lot of uh, multiple infections with multiple DTUs. We still don't know how that can impact uh, disease progression, but this is definitely something we need to take into account for vaccine development that most patients won't be infected with just one clone of T. cruzi. They, have, they may have multiple infection with a TC1 and TC6 or TC2. Uh, so that's something important we need to consider for a vaccine development. We've been monitoring cardiac function in our Chagasic macaque uh, using e EKGs and echography. And uh, so far we don't see any major arrhythmias but we start seeing increase in some uh, intervals of the EKGs. And so some of the animals are starting to present conduction defects. And actually last week we had one of the first animals that was diagnosed with uh, cardiomegaly and really uh, starting to present significant cardiac alterations. But we're also interested in understanding better what's the immune response of those animals uh, to correlate that with the EKG alterations and uh, uh, parasite genotypes. 
uh, there have been a lot of conventional immunology that's been done and that's been presented in, in several of the, of the previous talk. But we were interested in using a, a new approach to try to get a more integrative picture of the immune response using RNA sequencing. So, um, because when you do conventional Im immunology, you have to select what populations of cells you're interested to look at. So what we did was to take PBMCs from Ch Chagasic macaque and uh, did RNA sequencing and we obtained between 10 to 20 million reads per samples. And the idea is to use those transcriptomic analysis to try to reconstruct the immune system of those animals. Uh, we were able to identify over 400 genes that are differentially expressed between Chagasic and control macaques. And you can really see a, um, a very strong pattern that's clearly distinctive from those Ch uh, Chagasic animals. So what are those 400 genes do? Well, not surprisingly, most of them, and I have highlighted uh, them in yellow, are involved in uh, immune processes or regulation of immune processes. And this is still preliminary, so we're still analyzing those data. But just to give you an idea of the kind of data you, we can get, and I don't expect you to be able to read all the small prints on that slide, but this slide shows you all the major chemokines and, and uh, cytokines and their receptors, and uh, they're color coded based on uh, whether they're upregulated or downregulated. So with that kind of data, we can really look at the integrated picture of what uh, the, the immune response can be. And just to highlight a couple of examples, we do see increase in IL-12 and interferon gamma, for example, and their receptors. But also look down there, uh, IL-17 cytokines, uh, only one is upregulated and all the other are un unaffected or downregulated, suggesting a, a lack of uh, TH17 uh, cell activation. But we really want to go even further in our understanding of uh, what cell populations are activated in those Chagasic macaques. So we're also starting to use single cell uh, RNA sequencing of those PBMCs. So in those experiments, we uh, three to 5,000 PBMCs analyzed individually for RNA sequencing, and we get between 40 to 60,000 reads per cell. So on those graphs, each dot is a cell from our BMC population from control and Chagasic macaque. And you can immediately see the differences in cell population from those uh, Chagasic macaque. And again, this is very preliminary and we're still going through those data, but just to give you a snapshot of our first results, we don't see much change in CD4 uh, T cells. We see a small decrease in CD8 T cells. There's a large expansion of B cells in those Chagasic animals. We see a small increase in Treg, a large increase in dendritic cells, and a very strong decrease in Th17 T cells. So there's really a lack of Th17 activation in those Chagasic macaque. So the idea is really to put all those data together and really link into detail the, the profile of the immune response, cardiac function, parasite burden, and parasite genotype to see if we can understand better how those animals are progressing toward disease or not. But we obviously want to use those animals uh, to test our vaccine. And so far we've only done uh, tests to look at the safety of immunogenicity of our vaccine in uh, naive macaques. Uh, so we really made sure extensively uh, that those animals were uh, free of ticker's infection before being enrolled in, in the experiment. They received three doses of our vaccine with a TLR4 adjuvant. Uh, and then we took blood samples to look at uh, the immune response of those animals. So first in terms of biosafety, we looked at blood chemistry and blood cell counts. Uh, and at least with those parameters, we saw no alteration whatsoever uh, in those aspects. So uh, there seems to be no nephrotoxicity, no hepatotoxicity of our uh, vaccine in those uh, rhesus macaques. Uh, we looked at antibody response. Uh, and after the three doses of vaccine, we reached very high titers of antibodies against uh, TC24 and TSA1. Uh, and you can see here on the Western blot, those antibodies really recognize our two vaccine antigen very well. And they also recognize the native antigen 
in a whole parasite extract in that lane here. We also detected some cellular immune response. Uh, I'm showing you here the CD4 T cells stimulated by TSA1 or TC24 that produce TNF alpha, IL2, and interferon gamma. So there is a little bit of um, uh, T cell immunity induced by the vaccine. But again, we want to use our NSIC uh, to really look at the detail and the comprehensive idea of what's going on in terms of the immune response. Interestingly, we really need to wait for the third dose of vaccine to see any change in the uh, gene expression profile of PBMCs from those animals. But again, we're looking at PBMC. So this is really a uh, systemic immune response uh, that we're looking at. Again, there's uh, uh, over 680 uh, genes that are differentially regulated with a very clear uh, pattern of gene expression between pre and post vaccination in those animals. Uh, so this is still preliminary and we're still analyzing those data. But when we compare the cytokine and chemokine profile of naturally infected Chagasic macaque and vaccinated uh, naive vaccinated animals, we can see some differences. And just to point out a few, uh, with vaccination, we get a much broader and balanced immune response compared to natural infection. So we get both uh, pro-inflammatory and anti-inflammatory cytokines that are produced. And I'm focusing here again on I IL-17 uh, cytokines. Uh, that are all upregulated through vaccination. So we really hope that that broader immune response will be more protective uh, in vaccinated animal compared to uh, natural infection. But that's uh, gonna be the next step of uh, our studies to look at uh, the efficacy of the vaccine in macaques. So where we are right now uh, in our uh, Chagas uh, vaccine development effort, we really hope that within the next couple of days, we can gather enough uh, preclinical data to really support the initiation of phase one clinical trial in humans. Uh, so hopefully in the next few years, we would be able to uh, initiate those phase one trial in humans to look at again, the safety and efficacy of that vaccine. So that would be in uh, healthy volunteers and infected um, volunteers, and then if that's successful, moving into phase two or three, looking at the efficacy in uh, decreasing infected patients. So uh, uh, similar to what Emilio presented, we still have a very long road to go, but I think we're on the right track and uh, hopefully uh, some of those studies will be successful. So I just want to end by thanking all the collaborators, uh, students in my lab who have working hard on some of those studies, collaborators at Tulane with uh, Claudia Herrera, Pierre Bukens, uh, colleagues at the Primate Center with Preston Marks, Miti Carr, uh, Josh Taylor, uh, coll some colleagues from our vaccine consortium, Peter Hotez and Maria Elena Botassi at the Bella College of Medicine, uh, our colleagues in Mexico, Miguel Rosado, Li uh, Liliana Villanueva, Vladimir Cruz, uh, and Jaime Ortega at Civestav in Mexico. Uh, multiple funders and mostly from the Carlos Slim Health Institute for our vaccine efforts. And thank you for your attention and I'll be happy to take questions. Thank you so much, Eric. Very nice talk, really. Uh, here a question from uh, Israel Molina. He said, very, very, very interesting talk in relation to the vaccine in mice. Apart from the EKG or cardiac function results, are there any microbiological data regarding to parasite burden in tissue, peripheral blood, and serology? And the same question for macaques experiments. OK, so uh, quick answer for the macaques. We don't have any uh, data because these were, uh, were uh, the data I presented were, was on naive macaques, and we haven't tested uh, 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 infection in those animals, and we haven't tested the vaccine in uh, infected macaques yet. Uh, for the uh, mouse studies, we do have plenty of data in terms of uh, immune response and uh, parasite burden. Uh, 
that do show a very intensive immune response with uh, production of interferon gamma antibodies, uh, activation of uh, CD8 T cells. Uh, in terms of uh, parasite burden, uh, we have conflicting results because it seems that uh, we already have a very low parasite burden in those mice, uh, particularly in the chronic phase. So we do, don't see so much uh, additional reduction in parasite burden uh, because it's already so low. Uh, but we do have all those data that uh, match the EKG data. And so here, uh, Emilio said, great talk, Eric, excellent, it's excellent that several vaccine candidates are on track. Yes, really. Also, Jaime Lopez said, thanks a lot for the great talk. Uh, also, Walter Dutra. Uh, but here, a question from Andres uh, Alberti. Great talk, Eric. Which is the crusade exchange do you use for the bulk C mice challenge study? You show the ATC data. Yeah, we use uh, a TC1 strain uh, from Mexico for our challenge experiment in mice. Uh, obviously, this is a limitation because, as I mentioned, we really need to think about vaccine efficacy against a very large diversity of strain and infections with multiple strains. But this is something that's going to be really difficult to, to test in uh, experimental infection because you can only test a limited number of strains in those challenges. So I think really field studies will be critical to, to really see if a vaccine can be uh, effective in really against natural infection with a huge diversity of parasite strains and uh, multiple infections. Another talk from Susana Lausela, very informative talk. You immunosuppress the mice after the vaccination Vesnida cell combined therapy and the regimen in human will be the same combination of the vaccine with the nidazol? Okay, uh, so no, we don't immunosuppress the mice at the end uh, of treatment. Uh, we know there's still parasite there and uh, we don't think it's really feasible to target sterile immunity. But in the end, that's really not the target of the vaccine. We really want to, to preserve cardiac function and if patients can remain in that uh, asymptomatic phase, even though they still carry the parasite, that's probably a uh, good enough target for, for, for us and for Chagasic patients to prevent their mor morbidity and mortality. Um, so for the uh, vaccination and treatment regimen for, for human, uh, we're certainly uh, are considering both either uh, therapeutic vaccination alone or in combination with uh, benzenidazole. Uh, and there, there are multiple options. And uh, I think um, uh, Emilio presented different scheme in which uh, giving first benzenidazole and then immunotherapy or, or the other way around, starting with uh, therapeutic vaccination and then giving benzenidazole, or as we did in our uh, mice uh, studies, both at the same time, I think we will need trials to figure out what works best. Um, Eric, I know that we are far, but there, oh, there is a light in the dark of digested patients, patients with this neglected inside the neglected disease? Well, I think we're still far away, but I think what's encouraging is that as we've seen this morning, we have multiple groups uh, working in the same direction, trying to, to have a vaccine forward. And if we looked back 10 or 20 years, that wasn't the case. So, I mean, this is really encouraging that a lot of people are interested in uh, trying to develop a, a Chagas disease vaccine. Okay, and any uh, question? Well, thank you, Eric, so much. Very nice talk. Thank you, all our speakers today. Uh, we learned a lot about T cell migration and also uh, about vaccines. We hope that uh, we are very, very close to a vaccine for uh, these patients uh, that maybe are more abandoned now with the COVID infection that could be a possibility it's a pity but we are like this 
And well, uh, for my side, I want to again, uh, thanks all the audience uh, for being with us. And uh, we wait for you uh, next Monday. I don't know if Anna and Andres want to say anything else uh, or just to say bye-bye next Monday. I think it's, it's enough saying bye-bye. And I hope to see you next week, to all of you. Yes, yes. thank you very much to all the speakers. Really was a, a great uh, presentation. Thank you so, to, the, to the organizers. Yeah, thanks to you for putting this together. Yeah. Oh, please join us next Monday. Yes, we will. thank you very much. Eh, solo quería, bueno, voy a hablar en español en este momento, quería avisarles que por nuestras redes vamos a difundir el link por el cual estas, eh, los dos simposios que ya pasaron los vamos a difundir por el canal de YouTube de la Facultad de Ciencias Médicas. Luego se los vamos a enviar a todos. Así que bueno, hasta el lunes próximo y los esperamos a todos. Adiós. Adiós. Chao.